You may find it helpful to turn back to that passage. We read if you have a Bible with you. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in one of the seats nearby you, and it may be helpful to turn to the chapter. It may seem a slightly surprising chapter. And while I was preparing this, it came to my mind that I can't actually ever remember hearing anyone preach on this chapter apart from someone who was actually preaching through the book of Samuel and so dealt with this chapter as a matter of course. But it's a very uh, interesting chapter and it's part of God's word. And we have to remember that all of God's word is important. The Apostle Paul wrote these words, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. And you see, what that is telling us is that there is only one source of hope. There is only one ground of encouragement, and that is in what has been written. But the important thing to recognize, and I think sometimes we lose sight of this, the important thing to realize is that it was written for us. So that when the Holy Spirit moved the author of 1 Samuel to write 1 Samuel 7, it was because he had you in mind. That's the personal and peculiarly pointed aspect of the Bible. The Bible is just not a book of stories or a book of poetry. It's a book written to enable people to live the fullness of the life that God intends them to have. And so here we have uh, this chapter. And the one verse that is very well known from this chapter is verse 12 that says, Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. And you will see uh, from the footnote that Ebenezer means stone of help. And of course, that's a, a verse and a principle and a concept that has been central uh, to Christian thinking. The truth is, God helps his people. And whilst that's a statement of the obvious, it's a statement that we have to keep making to remind ourselves in times of difficulty and in times of temptation that we have a helper. As you see, throughout the whole of the Bible, this concept of God being our helper occurs time and time again. And so when the psalmist is celebrating God's protecting and keeping grace, he writes, Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That's Psalm 124. But actually, we read it in Psalm 121 because it's that frequent a statement. What is fascinating is that Mary, when she was singing that song, when she visited Elizabeth just before the Saviour was born, and reflecting on what God had done, she ended that song with these words. He, that's God, has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful. So the greatest miracle that has ever happened in the world, God taking flesh, being born as a man. That is a picture of the power and the degree of the help that God has for his people. Because, like the whole of Scripture, the birth of Christ was for us. We were involved 
when Christ was born, for he, di- he came for our sakes and he died on our behalf. And if you will remember in John 14, the Holy Spirit is called the paraclete. And you will, many of you will know that, that means uh, one called to one side or called alongside to help. So that some Bible translations translate John 14 and call the Holy Spirit the helper quite correctly. And Jesus actually said in John 14, I will send another comforter, helper, advocate, another paraclete. Because you see, Jesus for three years had been the helper of his disciples. And as he was about to leave this world, the Holy Spirit was to come to be that personal helper who comes alongside the people of God and strengthens and keeps them, guides and instructs them. And so here is this tremendous truth. And the whole reason for that is that God has made a covenant. There is that great eternal covenant between the Father and the Son. And one of the terms of that is this. I will be their God and they will be my people. So here is the most fundamental relationship. The most important relationship that any human being can have. To come into relationship with God and for God to say, I am your God, you are mine. And that's really what this chapter is all about. It's about how God helped his people in a time of failure and trouble. And I want us just to work through the passage. I have nothing original to say and nothing very sophisticated and clever. It's very simple. But I tell you, it's the most wonderful truth to strengthen your soul because the scriptures are given that we might have encouragement and hope that we might endure in an alien environment. And so let's look at this chapter. And the first thing we find in the chapter is very simply this, that Israel was in a mess. 20 years before uh, when Isaiah, when, when 1 Samuel 7 is speaking of, 20 years before uh, those events, Israel had been far from God. And they had been in battle with the Philistines. And they lost the first battle and then they re-engaged. And so they brought the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of the presence of God, the most sacred thing in the land. And they brought it in the most superstitious thing, as though it was a, a good luck charm. And they brought that to the battle. But they still lost the battle. And the Ark was taken captive. And then there comes, uh, and you can read it in uh, chapters uh, 5 and 6 of 1 Samuel, that amazing incident where the gods of, uh, of the Philistines, Dagon, is totally humiliated by God who was represented by the Ark of the Covenant until that Ark is returned. And it's returned uh, to uh, a, a place, and it comes at the end of chapter uh, 6. It, it, it was returned to uh, the, um, the people at Beth Shamesh. And they behaved in the most outrageous way. They looked into the covenant. And they experienced God's judgment. And they said these words. And the people of Bath Shemesh asked, Who can stand in the presence of the Lord? 
this holy God? To whom will the ark go up from here? Israel was in a mess. And the reason was that holiness was seen as an inconvenience. God was in their midst, represented by the ark. And they just treated it with contempt. They treated it so badly. And chaos reigned. There was no awe. There was no thankfulness. There was no rejoicing that the ark had returned. There was only misdemeanor upon misdemeanor. And so our chapter starts with the solution to their problem in that they place the ark with this man Abinadab. And the ark was there for 20 years. The ark should have been returned to the tabernacle, should have gone back to Shiloh, where the worship of God was carried out. But for 20 years, there was total indifference. They had a problem with God, and they were indifferent about God. And that is emphasized that when Samuel comes on the scene, he has to say to them, get rid of the foreign gods and the Ashtaroths, and serve the Lord. They had replaced God. They had put something in his place that they thought was better. And as you read these opening verses, what you see is a picture of a society that has forgotten God. We know something of that. We live in the midst of that. And men and women in our culture and in our nation have a problem with God. They don't want a God who is holy. They want a God that they can use. A God that will serve their requirements, their demand. But a God that demands obedience and repentance and a dedicated life not on their agenda, just as he wasn't on Israel's agenda. And being without God leads to a life without hope. Because the only way to find hope, according to Paul in the verse we looked at a minute ago, is to listen to God's voice, to hear God's word, to obey what God says. And so here was Israel, and they were in a mess. But then something quite remarkable happened. Because if you look at verse 2 of 1 Samuel 7, at the beginning of 1 Samuel 2, we are being told about the indifference of Israel. The ark remained at Kiriath Jairam a long time, 20 years in all. And then it says, then all the people of Israel returned, to, returned back to the Lord. We see God at work. We see Israel being restored. The word Translated, turn back. It's translated in other places by lament. It has this sense of sorrow, this sense of uh, mourning. They returned to God, but they did so with deep regrets, with tears of sorrow. Because God was drawing them back. And we know that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. 
God was bringing these people to repentance. And it may be that you're here. And your conscience, you don't really know God. You're conscious of the, the aching voice, an aching void in your heart, of the meaningless of your life. You're looking for answers. And the answers are in Jesus Christ. But there has to be a repentance, a change of heart. And that's what Samuel comes to do. Samuel, for those 20 years, to appears, appears to have been fairly silent. Back in chapter 4, verse 1, we read that the word of God came to Israel through Solomon, through Samuel. But then not a mention of Samuel in the verses that followed. Until we get to this verse, when Samuel suddenly comes forward, and he comes forward with a summons to repentance, and he goes to the heart of their problem. And the heart of their problem was very simply the problem of their hearts. That's why he says to them, he says, rid yourself of the foreign gods and commit yourselves to the Lord. He tells them that if they're returning, they must do so with all their hearts. The, the demand of God upon the sinner who repents is a total turnaround is a readiness to be changed, is a willingness to acknowledge their own sin and wrong. God was dealing with Israel and he brought them to a, a, an end of themselves. And we see so many pictures of this in, in the scriptures. Jonah was trying to run away from God. And he's in the, the belly of a big fish. And his future is terribly unsafe, uncertain. And he comes to one conclusion, which comes at the end of his prayer. Salvation comes from the Lord. And David who knew what it was to be weary and to be at the end of his tether and sometimes maybe to have lost touch with God, writes in Psalm 23, he restores my soul. And Peter, one moment boasting, the next moment, denying, and then weeping after the Saviour looked at him, and then restored when he walked by the water. You see, this is God's way. He humbles that he might bless. And that leads us to the third point and it is simply this that Israel had an intercessor that was Samuel's role you see that in verse 5 he says to them assemble all Israel at Mizpah and I will intercede for you I will intercede to the Lord for you this was at the heart of his ministry and then in verse 8, when they are threatened by the, Pharise by the Philistines, he says, they say to him, sorry, do not stop crying out to the Lord our God for us, that he may rescue us from the hand of the Philistines. And what's the point of mentioning those things? Well, it's simply this, that in times of declension, 
whether they're nationwide or individual. We need men to pray for us. The greatest need of men and women is an intercessor. And they were being led back to God. So we're told at the end of verse 6 that Samuel was serving as leader of Israel. And what they do is they come together at Mizpah in repentance and prayer. That's what the pouring out of water and the fasting and the, uh, the public confession is all about. They're engaging in a time of self-humiliation. They're coming with honesty and with sincerity to come back to God, to know God again, to enjoy God's blessing again, to know deliverance from the tyranny that was threatening them. And I think it's wonderful, you know. I spoke about Peter just now. You remember that when Peter boasted that he would never uh, forsake the Lord, the Lord said, yes, you will. You'll deny me three times. He said, because Satan has desired to have you. And then he just added this. But I have prayed for you. You see, the Savior has a great value on prayer. He has a great assessment of praying people. And so they, they come back with repentance <clears throat> and in prayer. And there they renew sacrifices. It's clear they hadn't had sacrifices as a regular part of national life for those 20 years. Without God. Without thinking of him. But now a sacrifice is made. And you see, we, we read in verse 9, Samuel took a suckling lamb and sacrificed it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf and the Lord answered him. And in particular, he was crying out about one issue. While they were going through this time of repentance, the, Phar the Philistines became aware of this gathering at Mizpah and they saw it as an act of rebellion. And so they came to put down the rebellion before it got too far. So while uh, Israel are gathering before God, we read that the Philistines heard that Israel had assembled at Mizpah. The rulers of the Philistines came up to attack them. And when the Israelites heard of it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. But then we read something quite remarkable. We read of Samuel at the end of verse 9. He cried out to the Lord on Israel's behalf. And the Lord answered him. And it was a most astounding and amazing answer. Because we read, the Lord thundered with loud thunder against the Philistines and threw them into such a panic they were routed before the Israelites. Now yesterday morning, fairly early, about half past seven yesterday morning, there was a really loud clap of thunder. But that was just child's play compared to what God did here. It was the most extraordinary uh, event. It was thunder that so confused hardened soldiers that they got in a panic. But it's something that there was a promise about. 
because Anna, Samuel's mother, when she gave thanks for Samuel, prayed these words. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. This is the holiness of God being painted for us. This is his, his greatness. This is the seriousness of not taking God seriously. And there was a promise that God had given about these situations when the children of Israel were threatened. In Leviticus 26, we read, Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. And in verse 11 of 1 Samuel 7, we read, The men of Israel rushed out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, slaughtering them along the way to the point below beth -car. Here is God's answer to Samuel's prayer. Samuel cried out, and these things happened. What Hannah had predicted, what God had promised, was actually worked out, because that's the way God works. That's why those who cry out to the Lord in sincerity find that he answers with grace and mercy and peace. And you see, these seem exceptional things. But very interestingly, David, when he was recounting God's mercies to him in Psalm 18, he says, God thundered. But actually, there's no record of David in his life having God thunder in answer to prayer. But God answered his prayer, and David is making the point that the phenomenal things that happened at Mizpah are done by the same great God who answers our prayers. That what we read here is just an illustration of the magnificence of the greatness of God, that God's answers to prayer are always wonderful events. That's why we need to sing to ourselves. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And as one of the Puritans once wrote, God's promises never lack fulfillment. Because you see, we're dealing with a God who is faithful, who keeps his promises who never fails his people. And so we come to verse 12, and Samuel lifts up the memorial. And he does so to focus on God's help. And so we read, Thus far the Lord has helped us, because in the place 20 years before where Israel were humiliated, and the Ark of the Covenant was captured. In that very same place, God delivered Israel and defeated his enemies. Because, you see, God keeps his promises. But where, where it's translated here thus far, it can be translated up to this point up to now it can be either locational here at Mizpah or it can be temporal looking back over time and I'm sure that Samuel had in mind going back to God's promise to Abraham and the great covenant there and the way down the rolling centuries he had kept his people he had answered their prayers. He had kept his promises and been faithful. And he puts the stone up to remind people. And you see, 
as we look at this story, what we see are pictures of Jesus Christ. We see him as our great high priest. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Do you see, Israel had an intercessor in Samuel, but he's just a small picture of the great reality that is our experience, that we have this one who saves us completely, saves us utterly, saves us into eternity. And he is the one who ever lives to make intercession for us. And he does so by his presence in heaven, by the physical evidences of his love in his wounds, by his speaking to God for us. He is the one who ever prays for us. Israel needed an intercessor, and so do we. But the truth is we have the greatest intercessor, God himself in the person of Jesus Christ ever lives and his great focus his great purpose is to intercede for his people and that has consequences and the consequences are these so we may say with confidence the lord is my helper i will not be afraid what can mere mortals do to me this is the confidence we have the lord is our helper my dear friends, what challenges are you facing? What problems seem to be going to overwhelm you? What hardships are, are, are before you? What failures are there that have brought coldness into your experience? What wanderings away from God? My dear friends, you have a helper a helper who is the great intercessor, who is faithful to his promises, who will never fail you. Do you see, this is the ground of our confidence. We are not confident in what we are, but we are confident in who Jesus is and in what he does. He died for us. He lives for us. And he will come again for us because we matter to him. And our experiences, our difficulties are his opportunities to show you his grace as you focus on him and on him alone. But we come finally to the last part and that is that Israel entered into peace that's what the last few verses are about i'm not going to spend time on them really i just want to draw your attention to what that those final verses mean they are again pointing us to the lord under samuel israel entered a new time of peace and of tranquility and of blessedness and they had a time where their status was restored. No longer were they victims of a greater power. They themselves were blessed of God. And these verses teach us just four things. And with this I close. They teach us that he, is, he has redeemed us by his sacrifice. We know it. We need to consider it constantly. He restores our souls by his presence with us. That's what happens in these last few verses. He leads us in the paths of peace. And we can have peace in our hearts, though we live in such a troubled world. And he constantly, ever, speaks to God for us. And so John can write that when we do fail, when we do sin, we have someone 
who is our advocate, who speaks to God on our behalf. And that's what this chapter is simply telling us. God is our helper. Because in Jesus, we have a great saviour and a permanent intercessor. And God is faithful to all his promises. There he is, his ever-present help, as it says in Psalm 121, because he is an ever-faithful God.